The early 90s were home to many a great debate. Do you drink Coke or Pepsi? Vote for Bill Clinton or George Bush? And most important of them all, which is better, the Super Nintendo or the Sega Genesis? Genesis does! 16-bit arcade graphics. You can't do this on Nintendo! An argument as old as time, these were the console wars. While during the late 80s, the NES basically held a monopoly over most third-party Japanese releases, when the next generation turned around, developers actually had to choose which console to make their games for, Nintendo or Sega. The two systems had incredibly different architectures, so cross-platform releases were very much uncommon back then. Most Japanese companies still primarily made their games for Nintendo. It was, after all what they were more comfortable with, and despite Sega's early lead, the SNES would go on to win the war. However, it was undeniable that the Genesis' install base was just too large to ignore. So while companies such as Konami still mostly made games for the SNES, here and there they would still create a couple of games for Sega's console, with one of the more well-known of these titles being Castlevania Bloodlines. Released in March of 1994, Bloodlines is definitely one of the less talked about classic Castlevania outings. Its reputation is mostly positive, but in the grand scheme of things, this is more of a side game, doing quite a few things pretty differently than the rest of the series. The first time I played Bloodlines was, and this is the final time I am going to be saying this the version on the 2019 Castlevania Anniversary Collection, where I remember being very impressed by its presentation, but also having a few issues with it, which I felt kept it from true greatness. Now, Bloodlines has the misfortune of being released after Rondo of Blood, and if you watched my video on that game, then you'd know that that's a pretty tough act to follow. But seeing as Bloodlines was released only around 5 months after Rondo of Blood, I think it's fair to assume that both games were in development around the same time, and were created by mostly different teams. So for that reason, I think it's more fair to look at Bloodlines for what it is rather than what it isn't. Because, and I'm just gonna say it right now, I think Rondo of Blood is the better game in pretty much every way. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and without further ado, let's take a look at Castlevania Bloodlines. Bloodlines presents a premise that's as simple as it is intriguing. The game takes place way further than any of its prequels. Previously, Rondo of Blood was the most recent installment in the timeline, being set in the year 1792, but Bloodlines pulls us all the way forward into 1917. To put that into perspective, that was during the very first world war. Yeah, this ain't really that medieval anymore, now is it? The game tells of an evil vampire maiden who goes by Elizabeth Park who has traveled all over Europe in hopes of bringing her uncle, the one and only Count Dracula, back from the grave. And so it is up to our two heroes, John Morris and Eric Lecard, to put a stop to her schemes and prevent Dracula's revival. So yeah, once again we have a pretty simple premise. However, what I feel to be the most interesting part of that summary is that for the very first time in the entire mainline series, the game does not star or even feature a Belmont of any kind. While John and Eric are said to be the Belmont's descendants, and heck, John even wields the vampire killer and is basically a Belmont in all but name, their absence here is nevertheless very much peculiar. And for now, that's all I can really say about that. Maybe I'll talk about this again in like, a uh, give or take for years or something. Who even knows at this point? As that premise hinted at, Bloodlines is presented as a bit of a tour of sorts. Instead of Transylvania, the stages here are all based on various European locations. You know, it's the usual landmarks. Greece, Italy, Germany, France, all of that good stuff. This does mean that Bloodlines' adventure is a relatively short one, only being comprised of six levels, which is quite a bit less than what we've come to expect as the standard. However, set stages are much longer than most others in the series, often containing numerous areas, bosses and set pieces, and it is those set pieces which I believe to be the most memorable part of Bloodlines, but let's put a pin in that for now. Compared to the Super Nintendo, the Sega Genesis was the relatively weaker system, 
The SNES had a far wider color palette and doubled the RAM size. However, the Genesis did notably have the faster CPU. This tech advantage would later be coined by Sega as Blast Processing, theoretically allowing for faster, more action-packed games. It's no coincidence that speed also happens to be the defining trait of Sega's mascot, the one and only Kazuma Kiryu. Oh, and also that blue dude, I guess. And it is also no coincidence that Bloodlines is a far faster paced Castlevania than those that came before it, which is mostly attributed to the far faster player and enemy speeds. If you're playing Bloodlines right after another game in the series, it will likely feel a bit frantic. At times, it's almost as if the game is running at turbo speed, kinda like watching a YouTube video and setting the playback speed to 1.5, but I think that most people will probably get adjusted to the faster pace pretty quickly. And in the long run, I feel that it adds to the replayability of Bloodlines, which despite not mattering much to me for reasons we'll get later on, is still definitely a sizable plus. Once again comparing it to the SNES, Sega marketed the Genesis as the far more mature console, trying to paint Nintendo system as being kiddie in comparison. Due to that, Sega was far more lenient with what they allowed to put in their games. And as such, Bloodlines sure has blood. Yeah, I don't really have much to say about this. Some enemies bleed when defeated, and Derek Spear falls on him when he dies because he is just that unlucky. Honestly, I don't think the gore here is really all that extreme, like... At all? Hell, I'd argue that the torture chamber from Chronicles alone is far more graphic than anything we see in Bloodlines. The only reason I even bring this up is because it actually caused the game to get censored over in PAL territories. Instead of Bloodlines, they got Castlevania the New Generation. That name is far more accurate to what the game is about, but damn it, Bloodlines is a cooler title. Just let my inner edgelord have this one. The New Generation is basically the exact same game as Bloodlines with only a few graphical changes made to remove any amount of gore. I'd still probably take Bloodlines over the new generation, seeing as some parts, like the fountain section in stage 5, just feel off without the blood. Also, and this should probably go without saying, but if you're playing on original hardware, the new generation will run at a lower frame rate, due to PAL TVs from that era only going up to 50 Hz, as opposed to America and Japan 60. But thankfully, emulators can mitigate this completely. Hooray for video game preservation! But alright though, let's get into what I was talking about earlier. As you might know, I'm not really much of a Genesis guy. I personally think the Super Nintendo was the superior 16-bit system. The Genesis has a library that I never found to be all too appealing, and I'm not a big fan of how Genesis games look and sound. When compared to the SNES, I think it's a pretty big step down. However, then came Castlevania Bloodline. I'm not sure how much of a popular opinion this is, but I think that Castlevania Bloodlines is undisputedly the best looking game in the original system's entire library. It carries over a similar art style from Rondo of Blood, and considering that we're on far weaker hardware now, that is incredibly impressive. The enemy sprites are all once again highly detailed, though as a compromise, the sprites here are certainly bigger than usual. The backgrounds, while still not as good as Chronicles, I still think you're a step up from Wonder of Blood. Due to the game's varied level setups, we get what are easily some of the most creative and unique environments in the entire series. Level 4, for example, takes place in a factory, which is not only a clever use of the game's more modern time setting, but it also means we get to go off against robot skeletons. Now come on, that is freaking incredible. In general, I just really like the vibe this game gives off. While I think that Rondo of Blood does mostly look better due to its higher level of detail, the overall atmosphere of Bloodlines is one that just generally appeals to me more. If Castlevania Bloodlines was a person, then I would be the first to follow them on Twitter. It's kinda hard to talk about the level design here, what with how many times we've already been through this whole spiel, but rest assured, it is good. We've got some cool new enemies, more fun and unique obstacles, the stuff here is solid, though I do think that some of the enemies here 
we have a little bit more health than I think was necessary. But anyways, oh my god, the set pieces. Okay, so what I would define as a set piece here is a part of the game that's kinda just there to show off what Konami were able to do with the system. And these are easily the absolute coolest sections of the whole experience. Stuff like the reflecting water in stage 2 and glittering sunlight in stage 5. I didn't even know the Genesis could do any of that stuff. And then we get to stage 3 taking place in Tuscany, easily my favorite level in the game. It largely revolves around the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Early on you put it in another scrolling section inside the tower as it is literally tilting from left to right. And then near the end of the level, you get sent to another auto scrolling area, where you have to navigate on a bunch of floating platforms literally circling around the tower, culminating with taking down the boss on top of it, again, while it is rotating. The way they were able to use the Genesis' hardware here is absolutely unreal, and it is an absolute marvel of a technical showcase. Though admittedly, I do think they kinda got burnt out near the end. The final level is honestly kinda lame. Its second room has this weird visual distortion with some of the horizontal lines getting out of sync, kinda just adding annoyance to an otherwise pretty easy section. And then the next room literally just flips the camera upside down. Like, what's even the point of this? When I played the game for the first time on the Switch, when I got to this part, I no joke took out my Joy-Cons and flipped the system upside down, and I remember feeling like a freaking genius doing that. Honestly, there is still a stupid part of my brain that does still think these sections are pretty cool, even if I do concede that they aren't necessarily art. And now it's the part of the Castlevania videos where I talk about how the game controls. I promise you guys, we don't have that many titles in the classic series left. Please bear with me for just a little bit longer. As was said in the intro, we now have two playable characters, John Morris and Eric Lecard. Before getting into what makes them both unique, let's discuss what attributes they both share first. The jumps are once again completely locked, though you can still change direction in midair, just not influence your trajectory. Like in Rondo of Blood, stairs can be jumped on and out of, which is definitely a welcome inclusion. Even if the stair climbing animations in this game do admittedly look pretty wacky, Bloodlines is kinda weird in that it replaces a lot of series staple items with different ones that are functionally the exact same. You still destroy candles and eat meat to restore your health, but then, for some reason, instead of hearts, the sub weapons now use these jewels as ammo. These function identically to hearts, so I don't really get why the change was made. Though I guess that's not much different than having a Morris instead of a Belmont. There's also other stuff like an orb replacing the invincibility potion, and the mirror of truth replacing the rosary. We only have three standard sub weapons this time around, and these are shared between both characters. The axe and holy water are back, and mostly function as they always have, though you now throw the holy water above you, which took a bit to get used to. But then we have the boomerang, returning from hunted freaking castle. While it acted as the dagger replacement in that game, that game was also very stupid. Like, why would you put a boomerang item in your game and not have it come back to you when you throw it? You know, it's only the boomerang's defining trait. Thankfully though, Bloodlines fixes this, as the boomerang is now the replacement for the cross. Though it does have a bit of an arc to it now, the sub weapons are once again used with their own separate button. However, by holding up while pressing that button, you can execute a special move for the price of 4 jewels. These are kinda like the item crushes from Rondo of Blood, only far cheaper and less devastating. Still though, I need addition. Sadly, discarded sub weapons don't drop to the ground like they did in Rondo. Whatever you get replaces what you had earlier, and that's the end of that. Though a nice touch here is that candles containing sub weapons will always only have a single light, with ones that don't having two lights, which makes that earlier complaint less of an issue. Though, to be honest, I don't really have much of a preference in sub weapons here. I usually just take whatever the game throws at me and stick with it. Likely a consequence of how few of them there are here. Once again, you're going to have to upgrade your main weapon. This time using these coat of arms. Though Bloodlines does not 
introduce an elusive third upgrade for said weapons, the undulating whip for John and the blazing spear for Eric. This upgrade will infuse your weapon with weird electric holy energy, buffing its attack power and granting you each character's ultimate sub weapon. John gets the water dragon and Eric gets the thunderbolt spear. They both cost 7 jewels and as you would expect, will absolutely decimate anything that comes your way. When you have these, you'll feel unstoppable. However, here's the catch. When holding on to this state, getting hit just once will downgrade your weapon and make your ultimate sub weapon disappear. Kinda like Castlevania the Adventure. However, seeing as the downgrade only applies when in this ultimate state, I actually quite like it. With how rare achieving this upgrade is, it makes holding on to it incredibly rewarding. Especially if you use this little cheat code. In the options menu, set the BGM to 5, SC to 73 and then press start. If you've done that successfully, you'll now get to hear vampire killer, bloody tears or beginnings when getting these upgrades. I honestly think they should have just made this the default. It makes getting these powerful weapons all the more satisfying. And it makes losing them all the more frustrating. Since we're already on that topic, how is the music in Castlevania Bloodlines? Well, as if you even need to ask, it's all great as for the series standard, but I sadly don't feel it's much more than that. And I feel that that is mostly attributed to the Genesis sound hardware, which, as I said earlier, I don't think is very pleasant on the ears. The remixes here are nice. But these tracks have already been arranged so many times as it is, and the versions of them here are definitely not the first I would choose to listen to. But I mean, at least they've also got Simon's theme, for some reason. It only plays during the steps towards Dracula. If you're just bailing it there, you'll barely even get to hear the full track. Why this is here I do not understand, but I guess I can't really complain about it. However, the real victims here are the original tracks as I think that most of them, composition-wise, are absolutely stellar. Calling from Heaven, the final stage theme, is especially incredible. It just sucks that as it is in game, I'm not very big on how it sounds. This is a soundtrack that I do think is better than something like Castlevania 4, but I unfortunately don't really see myself listening to it much outside of the game. However, I will give it this though. Most fan-made remixes of the music from Bloodlines are absolute fire. To all of you remixers out there, keep up the great work. But with all of that out of the way, let's move on to our playable characters. Starting out with John Morris, new wielder of the vampire killer. And man, talk about using this thing weirdly. John can whip directly down, not down diagonally, only directly down, as well as upwards diagonally exclusively while in mid-air. And yeah, that sure is weird, though John does come with a pretty cool new trick. Back in Castlevania 4, Simon was able to use his whip to latch onto certain grapple points, which would then allow you to swing around. Bloodlines doesn't have this, however, as in Instead, you can grapple onto any ceiling you want. This here is a really neat movement option that I seriously wish was put into better use. The game has a couple of fun secret areas that require the execution of it, and there are a few John exclusive sections which put your grappling skills to the test. However, I feel that this movement option has a lot of untapped potential, potential which the game doesn't really touch upon, an unfortunate consequence of the two character setup. But still, John is overall fun to control, or I guess Johnny as he is known in Japan. I guess you could say only some call him Johnny. Our second hero is Eric Lecard, or is it Lecarde? Eh, I'm not sure. He wields the Alcarde Spear, which is actually a mistranslation, what it's actually supposed to be called is the Alucard Spear, forged by the very same Alucard from Castlevania 3. A very random detail, but a welcome one. I also really like Eric's design, he was basically the serious 
as its first ever fanboy. And for that, I couldn't be more grateful. Oh, damn it, but they made his face more masculine outside of Japan. Screw you, Konami. The Alucard spear functions pretty similarly to the vampire killer, supporting identical damage output. Like John, Eric can attack straight below him while in mid-air, but while Eric can't attack upwards diagonally while in the air, he can do so when on ground, as well as attack straight above him. There is also this spinning move you can use by changing directions after a regular attack, but I honestly never really found much use for that. Instead of swinging around, by crouching for a bit, Eric can perform an extremely high vertical jump, which is definitely far more useful than what John can do. And you know what? This brings me into a bit of an issue. If those earlier descriptions didn't make it clear, Eric is pretty much better than John in almost every way. There are a few areas where John has the upper edge, but those pale in comparison to how much of the game Eric can just blaze through. I think it would have made more sense if John's attack were given higher damage outputs. That way, it could be seen as him being the better option for bigger enemy encounters, with Eric as the more mobile of the two. And regardless of that, I think the game should have just let you switch characters that we like in Dracula's course. The intro presents it as if both of them are going on this adventure together, but you can only pick to play as one of them for the entire playthrough. Now I can see that some might argue I'm being a bit hypocritical here, as back in Rondo of Blood, Maria was easily better than Richter, and you couldn't switch between the two, but you see, in that game, Maria was pretty clearly presented as more of a bonus, with Richter being the quote-unquote intended way to play through the game. However, in Bloodlines, not only are the characters both far more similar than Richter and Maria from Rondo, but right as you start, the character selection screen presents them both as complete equals. There's nothing here signifying that Eric is better than John in pretty much every way, and in my opinion, that's pretty misleading. But okay, allow me to correct myself on something I said earlier. You are actually given the option to change characters after a game over, but only if you play on easy mode. Because yeah, Bloodlines has three different difficulties. The higher the difficulty, the more enemies you'll have to deal with. The easy mode does remove a few boss fights, and you have to beat the game in normal mode in order to unlock expert mode. I do like the idea of multiple difficulties, but what I don't like is how these affect the endings you get. Get. The higher the difficulty, the better your ending will be, which is already annoying enough. But the worst part is that there aren't even unique endings for each difficulty. The screen just fades out sooner the lower your difficulty is, which is kinda just a really lame way to lock the true endings out. Luckily, the game does function on a password system, so if you want to, you can just go right to the final level on expert difficulty in order to see the true ending. But this actually kinda brings me into what is probably my biggest issue with Castlevania bloodlines. The continue system. Okay, so on the surface, it seems seems to be the same as any other game in the series. You get to pick how many lives you have by default in the options menu, and when you lose them all, you get a game over. However, game overing doesn't actually send you back to the start of the level. It basically works the same as dying normally here. Oh wait, no, excuse me. Getting a game over resets your score counter. Oh no, not my high score. The lack of penalty from game overs makes sense, however, considering that blood Lines has limited continues. <clears throat> Excuse me for a second. Why? Why are we bringing back limited continues now? The series abandoned that concept ages ago. I thought we all agreed that this was just a stupid artificial way to increase playtime, forcing you to play through the whole freaking game again if you die too many times. Why have this return here? Is it because Sonic had limited continues? Well, that was also stupid. And the continue system doesn't even make sense here. The game also has a password system, so after you get knocked back to the title screen, you can just enter a password to return to the stage you died on. Did anybody actually think this through? Bleh, I'm sorry. But I think that this right here is just ridiculous. And it heavily knocks down the game's replay value for me. If you plan on playing Bloodlines, then my god, set your default lives to 5. Some might argue that I could mitigate this by using an unlimited continues hack, but the issue then is that it would make lives entirely pointless. 
and in turn make the game too easy. Castlevania is a series that's designed with having limited lives in mind. Infinite lives won't really work as well here as much as they do in something like Super Meat Boy or Celeste. This is sadly just to pick your poison situation, which is very frustrating. Maybe one day someone will make a ROM hack of bloodlines that gives you unlimited continues, but makes getting a game over send you back to the start of the stage. As far as I know, something like that doesn't exist. But if someone ever did make it, I would easily consider it to be the definitive version of the game. But whatever, let's move on to the bosses. Even if, honestly, I don't have much to say about most of them. As expected, they all look absolutely gorgeous. And there's a healthy amount of mid-stage bosses to boot. However, like is the case in many of the previous games, most of them can be brute forced if you come with full health. Still though, this selection is definitely above average for the series. That is, until we arrive at the end game. Much like Castlevania 4, the final sections of Bloodlines have you going against a bunch of bosses in a row. Starting out is death in what is quite possibly his lamest appearance yet. He starts by circling himself with a bunch of cards that you need to take care of. Attacking these can either have death throw out an easily avoidable attack, give you a bunch of food only on normal and easy modes, or have you rematching one of the games as bosses, which is another stupid thing that's just there for padding. Though thankfully they do have far less defense this time around. After taking care of the cards, you battle death, who is an absolute pushover with both characters. Next up you move on to Elizabeth. She starts by turning into a Medusa that's pretty easy to take care of, but then you have to defeat her vampire form. In the absolute worst boss battle in the game, she keeps teleporting from left to right, and you have to consistently hit her the moment she appears, or else she'll throw out one of many dangerous attacks, one of which is literally unavoidable by the way. Even after you find out she only ever appears on the side opposite to where you stand, this battle is still stupid and takes way too long to finish. Thank god it gets completely skipped on easy mode. But then finally, we of course have Dracula. Supporting three phases, much like in Castlevania 3, he starts out by doing his typical teleporting around while shooting fireballs shtick, and after that he turns into this flying old mage dude, which is another pretty manageable phase, and then finally, he transforms into the literal Satan, for a final phase of that seems intimidating at first but can be exploited and taken care of shockingly easily. This really isn't one of the harder final bosses in the series, but for what it is, I still enjoyed it. And of course, the visuals are superb as always, but with that, Dracula is once again defeated, as the holy bloodlines of the new generation prevail once again. The complete ending has Castlevania once again collapse with John Morris still holding on to the Vampire Killer, which I'm sure is an absolutely fantastic idea, and Derek Lecard putting down his spear, setting out on a new adventure, concluding Castlevania Bloodlines. Looking back, this video ended up being far more negative than I originally anticipated, and that is because, contrary to many of the things I've said here, I do love Castlevania Bloodlines. At its core, it is still a very enjoyable Castlevania game. The level design is great, music rock solid, and visuals absolutely sublime. However, I've already talked about a lot of those things plenty of times before, which leaves out Bloodlines in a less favorable position. Let's put it this way, this is the 11th game in the series, and by this point the formula has already started to get a bit stale. So while Bloodlines does introduce quite a few really cool elements, it also has some design choices which I just find questionable. It's hard to talk about Bloodlines without bringing up Super Castlevania 4, as it clearly took a lot of inspiration from that game. I already said that Bloodlines is not as good as Rondo of Blood, but do I think it goes above Castlevania 4 or below it? Honestly, I'm not sure. Both of these games have pretty distinctive strengths and weaknesses, and they're both trying to achieve pretty different things. So while I am a bigger fan of what Bloodlines is trying to do, I I do think that Castlevania 4 does what it's trying to do better, so at the end of the day, I'm left in a tough position. For all intents and purposes, I think Castlevania 4 is the better game, however, I won't lie and say that personally, I do prefer Bloodlines. It's just got a vibe I really enjoy. Something about Bloodlines clicks with me in a way that Castlevania 4 doesn't, and it's definitely the far more interesting game of the two, but in the grand scheme of things, 
things. I think you owe it to yourself to play both of them. These are two of the finest 16-bit side scrollers on the market, and I think that they're definitely worth at least a look. However, I'm not sure if I could share that sentiment with the next installment in the series, Castlevania Dracula X. One of the most contentious titles in the entire franchise. As always, I'll hopefully see you all there, and until next time, have a good one!